In studio with New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap because they never bother to chart the worst-selling <laughs> ones. Johnny, good morning. Good morning. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey, Natalie Clad. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I still don't know what Natalie Clad exactly means. It's like she Natalie was Tenet. the brother. She was the sister of uh, Tommy Clad, right? <laughs> Natalie Clad. Yes, you know her. Our uh, guest in this segment is uh, on uh, a, sh- a short leash time-wise because he's got important people to meet with. Delegate Michael Hornby, owner of said radio station. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, guys. Good morning. How are things at the Delta House? They are good. Um, not spending much time at the house in the last week. We've been, it's been a busy week. Yeah, it's, it's been a pretty slow session, and now it's uh, time to hurry up a little bit. Um, yeah, it's so, kind of ramped up. The bills are yeah. starting to build up, so the the sessions are getting longer. Um, the issues and the, the 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 bills are getting longer. There's much more discussion. I think there'll be, especially tomorrow, probably lots of discussion um, with some of the bills coming up. So overall, this uh, the, how would you describe the feel of this legislative session, Mike, as compared to your first one last year? I I'm a lot busier. I feel uh, I feel like I'm a lot more part of the conversations. Um, maybe not so much on the floor, but um, I did make my first floor amendment yesterday. Um, it, it, it feels a lot busier, um, and I feel a lot more involved this time. Overall, is there? I don't hear as much of a struggle uh, in regards to the. Uh, more conservative wing of the Republican Party versus the business Republicans like I heard last year? Is that still very much alive, or has it smoothed a little bit? Well, I I think it it is alive still, but I think there are conversations happening behind the scenes where we we are talking um, and negotiating, and I don't think there's been as... We haven't got to those parts of the budget where we're appropriating funds yet, so um, I'm sure it's coming, but it seems like you know the, the parties get along well right now. All right. Give me an idea of some of the things that you're working on that are, that are close to getting some action. So uh, I have a home-based business bill that's uh, on third reading today. Um, uh, raw milk is, is, is on uh, – that's coming through. Um, I have the Healthcare Sharing Ministries um, Freedom to Share Act that's on second reading today. Um, so there's there's a lot of the legislation that is the state audit state audit of all the uh, boards of education is is up on second reading. I think that might be postponed. So I, I feel like I'm getting a lot of uh, the my lead sponsor bills done, but you know I, I am on a lot of lot of bills. Uh, working so we had mike pushkin on tuesday morning and he seemed to be totally certain that there would not be a raise for employees of the state this year any thoughts on that um i do i i think he's wrong there i think they are working on a five percent raise he seemed to feel that senate finance chairman eric tarr was against the raise and therefore it wouldn't happen (laughs) I don't talk to the Senate much. I mean, I know Eric. I see him here and there. I, I have not talked to him about the specific issue, but I know um, on the House side, I think that is part of the governor's budget, and we're working through the uh, the process. Hey, Mike, good morning. Could you put some meat on the bones of the home-based business bill? This first time hearing about that. John's so, very interested. Um, yeah, I am very interested. <laughs> Yeah, so basically what's happening, and we're seeing this across the United States and in some of the municipalities within West Virginia, is let's say if you're a writer and you have a small home in Martinsburg and you're making $20 million like Gilstrap does a month, (laughs) um, the, uh, the city can come in and say, hey, we want to charge you a fee for having a business in your home with, and my bill simply states, that a non-impact consultant, small business, you don't even know that the person is, is operating a business, cannot be charged fees for operating or, or doing or, or told they can't do business in their home. So especially since uh, COVID came along, we, we, there's a lot of people that can work from home, do podcasts, Etsy, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I, I just don't feel there should be any restrictions on a non a no impact business that you know they don't have a number of employees in their house they don't have a bunch of cars in the parking lot or things like that um, so it's more of a hey you know leave them alone if they're having no impact on the city. Are these fees common now? They are starting to pop up since COVID. Um, a, lo- a number of municipalities, not not Martinsburg, but a number of municipalities in West Virginia have enacted uh, some of these fees, saying you need to pay a percentage or a 
uh, business registration fee for a, to the municipality. Um, so, you know, the Secretary of State has, uh, if you have a, like, say you're a consultant, you register as a SOS, through the SOS, and you pay your business uh, business fee, um, you pay your taxes. Um, I don't think you, there should be a fee for up owning a business within your own home. Does that exempt, just so I'm clear, I'm sorry, John, does this exempt, like, the registration fee or just some sort of user fee? That, no, that it doesn't certain exempt the registration fee through the West Virginia Secretary of State. You know, all the, uh, all the, the rules for owning a business apply. It's a separate fee that they're imposing from, like, a, a municipality. Like a B&O? So if you're a lawyer and you're working from home, let's say, um, they would say, hey, you're working from your residence. You need to pay a, a business registration fee to the municipality. John, do you have to register with the Secretary of State as a business? I do. In fact, they just uh, just two days ago did this again. It's really strange. You, you fill out the form, and it's a $25 fee, and you're done. But then there's this random question that pops up. Do you sell scrap metal? So, uh, yep. No. Uh, just, it seems very random. There are a lot of things I don't sell, and among other, that, that's one of them. That's, one, that's <laughs> actually on the form? Yeah, it's on, on the form. Welcome so to West it, Virginia, John. It would, be, it, it would be for somebody like John or somebody that's a consultant or somebody that's working from home doing a podcast. Um, they're, they're already registered through the Secretary of State. They already pay their business registration fee. They already have a license. They have the insurance. But they happen to sit on their couch and, and work from their couch. That seems to strike me as overreach by the government. As and, and that's the reason severe overreach. that I had to write the bill is because um, we were getting some complaints, um, and some of these cities were, they've realized since COVID, a lot of people are working remotely um, in, in doing that thing, and they figure they can maybe throw a fee on there if they find out. Would this yeah. have any possible, uh, could be used to attract new residents to West Virginia? And I think it. I think it certainly would. And we made that argument in economic development, um, was saying, "Hey, you know, there are a lot of people in the D.C. metro area that work remotely, and uh, you know, cost of living in West Virginia is ex- much lower. Um, we could attract, you know, the gill straps of the world." Wasn't there a COVID era bounty that was put out where we pay people to come into the state? And it still and exists. It does it. Yeah, a COVID era. It's, not, it's like thirty grand. It's, it's there, real money. There are certain foundations that will pay you to move to West Virginia. Yes, you have to meet certain criteria. Um, whatever. That's but, the. But there is. Uh, going going back to what you said, Mike. Uh, someone like John Gilstrap, who's sitting at a keyboard typing away. Yeah. To to make to make that kind of a, a per- he's not really a business. He's well, not. He's, he's also not in city limits either. You know, but even if he was, what? it's not like they like you said. People aren't pulling up to his house to get a product. Trucks aren't dropping I mean, off. I know things. he's got tons of fans, and there's probably a thousand people outside his house. But sure, um, that's his neighbor's it, problem. It's one of the yeah. The, the the thing is, is you know he's sitting on his couch eating potato chips and typing on a computer. He is actually a business because he is generating revenue, uh, even though he's a one person business. Um, he shouldn't be penalized or, or charged for that within a municipality or a county. Hey, uh, go ahead, John. I was going to say, and actually, I, I do have, there is a company, Swift River Books LLC, yeah. is, is who writes my books. Right, I, but so. you write your books. Right. You know, it's not like you No, have I a, think it's a great bill. It's, it's you don't absurd have employees. that I should. So I might you, rename it the Gilstrap. Um, I would bill. like that. That would be great. <laughs> if you did that, you could do that in lieu of paying him to I mean, be this, a co host. This would just open up people to come into the municipal areas more. Uh, Mike, I want to ask about the uh, any progress with oversight of the SSAC. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, um, I don't want to get over my skis here, but, yeah, um, we, uh, we are negotiating or talking with um, the folks um, – in education, we, we, we're talking about uh, SSAC, transfer rule, uh, putting the SSAC under rules. We're, we're having those conversations a lot in the last few days. All right. I don't want you to get yourself in trouble. Yeah, I, I can't really get into it because it's not in uh, black and white just yet. Um, but the bill is sitting there waiting in education. Okay. Uh, then what, what else do you think you got uh, that's close to getting passed this year? Um, you can give us details about. 
I think uh, from, for the most part, I, I think my small business payroll tax credit has a chance of being looked at more than it did last year. Um, I have a... Um, I'm going to stop there for a second because I got, a yeah. comment, I got a comment about that, Bill. This would only be for newly created businesses. A business that was already in place would not benefit from it. Is that correct? A business that is already in place could benefit it from it if they move their employees from 1099 to the payroll system or W-2 so they get taxed. So it's an incentive for a small business, like let's say a contractor, to move their employees to um, to be on payroll versus a 1099 where the, the, the employee would then, you know. What about an, ex- an existing five five person shop that already is doing W-2s? Unfortunately, I cannot do that because uh, I felt it would be very self-serving if I if I included my business in that, so I did not include ex- existing businesses. Is there a chance that the bill could be amended to include that? The reason why I ask is because somebody who's a small business person said, listen, I like the bill, but it would be great if it would benefit someone like me who's been doing business in this community for years and years and years. Why does someone who's just starting get rewarded? Yeah. And I've already been paying taxes for 30 years. Why am yep. I not getting the rewards? And I agree with that 100%. And I think that's uh, Eric Tarr's argument, too. Um, I, ha- I would have no problem with that. However, this fiscal note would get a little bigger. Um, and, and we did put a cap on it. So the, the cap is 10400 uh, as a tax credit. So you couldn't be getting hundreds of thousands of dollars back from, from, from the West Virginia government. It, it would be capped the first year at 10400 second year at uh, 6000 third year at 3000 then you can't get it anymore. So it's only a three-year, mm-hmm. first three years of being in business. The intent of the bill is to help new businesses get their employees on payroll. Um, I found that when I started my business, that was the hardest thing was to actually get those first two to three, four employees on payroll, pay payroll taxes, because essentially you're paying extra money as a business. So the incentive was to help small businesses start. Um, And I understand existing businesses would love it, but existing businesses are already going through the process. Uh, I'm 15 years into my business. I understand every two weeks I got payroll. Um, You know, while I'd love that incentive, there is, there would just be, I think it would be silly for me to try and put that on existing businesses. It's, It's more an incentive for people to start businesses within West Virginia. So when you talk about payroll tax, are we talking about FICA and Social Security? We're talking about the payroll tax that the employer matches. So the employer pays half of the the, the West Virginia state um, tax. So it's really just talking about the West Virginia state tax that the employer is paying. Okay. Which is not a lot, but it's still something. Are you making any progress on the 140-day rule for retired school employees? I am not. I had a meeting with the insurance uh, commission and the uh, pensions, and they feel that if we enacted this, uh, I guess over the last few years we've we've raised it from 100 to 140. The school year is 180. If we raised it, it would incentivize teachers to actually more teachers to retire and then come back and work for the um, the school system. What that would do is really hurt our our pensions. Uh, fund. So they feel like teachers would actually retire and then come back and get a full-time job with the school system, get a full retirement, and get a full salary. So they'd be double dipping, essentially. Um, that's how they feel. The committee on, on pensions feels that way. I've, I've had those meetings, um, and, and it was just, it's not going to come out of committee. The, the chairman spoke to me and said, you know, it, it would break the pension system. Um, we are making progress on the uh, the bill that we have to let teachers bank their sick and personal days um, and, and use that in retirement. Uh, that has gone up to finance, and we are using the school aid formula to um, to fund that. Um, so I think that has a shot, um, a slim shot, but I think it has a shot. It's, it's made it through the pensions committee. Is the 140 day cut off negotiable to a slightly higher number? Anything that would help get somebody in the classroom because we've got a terrible shortage right now? I, I agree with you, but the, the, the argument is the IRS may come to us and say, you know what, 
this is you can't have a part-time employee working 75 percent of the school year. It's really intended for part-time employees. Uh, I, I completely understand the argument. I'm on on the side of trying to raise that, but it all comes down to IRS and the pension fund, and, and I can't seem to break that uh, or find a solution at this point. It sounds like a math problem, and if it's a math problem, it can be it solved. Is. So there's got to be some kind of sweet spot number that they can find that they can make it work. And, and, the, and the pensions, I guess, you know, back in, a couple of years ago, a few years back, it was at 100 days. We raised it to 120, and we raised it to 140. Um, it, it, it's just, it's one of those things where it's a conundrum, both sides. Are you, as you mentioned, the bill about banking personal and sick days, uh, yeah. is that going to get passed this year? I hope so. I'm working I'm working with the guys on finance right now. I've got a meeting with uh, Chairman Chris. Um, I've got a number of bills um, that are in finance um, that we are looking at. Um, so yeah, I, I hope so. And, I, and we have a coalition of people that are, are trying to get that one through. And is that continuing through without limit? You can bank as many. If you never take a sick day, you can retire with... It, it's basically, and I'll, I'll have to send you the bill number. Uh, it's Trenton Barnhart's bill. It's basically saying you know, what you haven't used, you can bank two to one or one one to two. Um, it, it's, it is a very complicated uh, bill, but it, I think it has the biggest shot of actually passing. That is HB 5139, by the way. I know you need to get yeah. going quickly here. Uh, Mike, any final questions? Yeah, from I got Matt? about four or five more minutes, but um, yeah, I've got a meeting with... Uh, with the boss, uh, principal, uh, householder has called me into his office to Ooh, talk about a, a couple uh, of things. So. Probably have to bring height yeah. with you. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I I got called by myself, so we, we got some negotiating to do on a couple of other things. All right. The, Mr. The, you mentioned the Freedom to Share Act. Was that, um, and I didn't get the full title, is that revolving around health uh, daycare or health care? Uh, it's about health care. So, the, for instance, Christian Healthcare Ministry, Samantha Ministry, a lot of these, um, you know, they've been around for about 20 years. They're, they're mostly ministry-based health care sharing. They're not insurance. Um, but a lot of these uh, organizations, nonprofits, will share each other's health care expenses. So instead of paying an insurance agent, you would share your health uh, expense. I know Matt Miller is, is, is a part of one um, where you would send your premium essentially to a person each month. And then that person would negotiate with the hospital um, a cash value of their medical expenses. Um, so. The insurance commission was trying to put these uh, sharing um, ministries under insurance. Uh, we managed to kill it last year, so I've been working for about a year um, with these uh, with the insurance commission and the healthcare ministries. To it basically says they are not insurance companies, but if there is an issue with a consumer and somebody wants to do something, the AG ha- can have the responsibility of, of investigating. Um, so it lets them still have the freedom to share. It doesn't have any restrictions from the insurance commission on them because they're not insurance companies. Um, and they are able to do business like they've been doing for the last 20 years. However, if there is a bad actor, the attorney general of West Virginia can step in. So it's so like a crowdsourcing for medical calls. And yes. The insurance companies are saying, we don't. we want oversight because this – well, well not, taking people not so out much of the insurance, insurance companies, pool. but the insurance commission is it was saying, hey, you know, they're they're they could be insurance. They should be treated like an insurance company. They have to have all these restrictions, but they're not an insurance company. They're a health care sharing ministry, and a lot of them are uh, Christian based, or um, and, and they're all over the, the United States. They haven't been regulated for the last twenty years. Um, you know, if, if somebody chooses to use one of these organizations, they should be, uh, and they can, t- can continue to do that. Last question for you, Michael. The uh, HB 5351 to amend the definition of commercial solid waste facility. Why is this an issue? So that is actually an Apple Valley waste um, issue. We have in Sorga in, in Martinsburg, and Sorga has been empty. Uh, Apple Valley waste cleaned that up for us. Um, that facility is kind of abandoned and not using, not being used. It's a 30, 20, 20 to $30 million facility. Um, Apple Valley Waste would like to use that as a transfer station and maybe in the future get that facility back up and running. 
Um, I guess waste management had some issues with that. So it, my bill was 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 simply uh, changing the words um, to enable the Apple Valley Waste to to do that. I've been talking to Clint Hogman, talking with uh, a number of people. Um, there is litigation going on. I don't think it's going to come out of committee just because there is litigation. And, and Chris, I talked to Chris Phillips. He doesn't feel comfortable running it because there is litigation. It's sitting in committee. I'm trying. I sit, I sit in front of Chris on the floor. I, I remind him every day. But um, I don't think I'm getting anywhere with that one. All right, dude. Uh, don't be late for your meeting. Say hey to Raj yep. and E for me, my man. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. All right, bye. That is Delegate Michael Hornby, owner of this establishment.